Hello, hello! Welcome back to another section of 100 Years of Solitude by Gabriel Garcia Marquez. Happy to have you back, or if you are just here for the first time, hi, I'm Julie. So glad to have you here in this little corner of YouTube where I read books. Um, we are getting to the, like three-fourths of the way through point, which is exciting. And oh, also I wanted to say um, someone mentioned um, that maybe I could like, host a, a discussion about the book. So, so yeah, if, if you're interested in something like that, leave a comment. Maybe I'll put like a poll in the community tab. We'll see. But, you know, inter interesting idea anyway. But for now, we are going to get going with another section, starting on page 293. If you are liking this one, hit the little thumb, subscribe so you don't miss the rest of the book. And let's go. Page 293. The events that would deal Macondo its fatal blow were just showing themselves when they brought Mimi Buendia's son home. The public situation was so uncertain then that no one had sufficient spirit to become involved with private scandals, so that Fernanda was able to count on an atmosphere that enabled her to keep the child hidden, as if he had never existed. She had to take him in because the circumstances under which they brought him made rejection impossible. She had to tolerate him against her will for the rest of her life because at the moment of truth she lacked the courage to go through with her inner determination to drown him in the bathroom cistern. She locked him up in Colonel Aureliano Buendia's old work workshop. She succeeded in convincing Santa Sofia de la Piedad that she had found him floating in a basket. Ursula would die without ever knowing his origin. Little Amaranta Ursula, who went into the workshop once when Fernando was feeding the child, also believed the version of the floating basket. Aureliano Segundo, having broken family with his wife because of the irrational way in which he handled Mimi's tragedy, did not know of the existence of his grandson until three years after they brought him home, when the child escaped from captivity through an oversight on Fernanda's part and appeared on the porch for a fraction of a second, naked, with matted hair, and with an impressive sex organ that was like a turkey's waddles as if he were not a human child, but the encyclopedia definition of a cannibal. Fernanda had not counted on that nasty trick of her incorrigible fate. The child was like the return of a shame that she had thought exiled by her from the house forever. As soon as they carried off Mauricio Babylonia with his shattered spinal column, Fernanda had worked out the most minute details of a plan destined to wipe out all traces of the burden. Without consulting her husband, she packed her bags, put three changes of clothing that her daughter would need into a small suitcase, and went to get her in her bedroom a half an hour before the train arrived. Let's go, Renata, she told her. She gave no explanation. Mimi, for her part, did not expect or want any. She did not know where they were going, but it would have been the same to her if they had been taking her to the slaughterhouse. She had not spoken again, nor would she do so for the rest of her life from the time that she heard the shot in the backyard and the simultaneous cry of pain from Mauricio Babylonia. When her mother ordered her out of the bedroom, she did not comb her hair or wash her face, and she got into the train as if she were walking in her sleep, not even noticing the yellow butterflies that were still accompanying her. Fernanda never found out, nor did she take the trouble to, whether that stony silence was a determination of her will or whether she had become mute because of the impact of the tragedy. Mimi barely took notice of the journey through the formerly enchanted region. She did not see the shady, endless banana groves on both sides of the tracks. She did not see the white houses of the gringos or their gardens, dried out by dust and heat or the women in shorts and blue striped shirts playing cards on the terraces. She did not see the ox carts on the dusty roads loaded down with bunches of bananas. She did not see the girls diving into the transparent rivers like tarpons, leaving the passengers on the train with 
the bitterness of their splendid breasts, or the miserable huts of the workers all huddled together where Mauricio Babylonia's yellow butterflies fluttered about, and in the doorways of which there were green and squalid children sitting on their pots, and pregnant women who shouted insults at the train. That fleeting vision which had been a celebration for her when she came home from school, passed through Mimi's heart without a quiver. She did not look out of the window, not even when the burning dampness of the groves ended and the train went through a poppy-laden plain where the carbonized skeleton of the Spanish galleon still sat and then came out into the clear air alongside the frothy, dirty sea where almost a century before Jose Arcadio Buendia's illusions had met defeat. At five o'clock in the afternoon, when they had come to the last station in the swamp, she got out of the train because Fernanda made her. They got into a small carriage that looked like an enormous bat drawn by an asthmatic horse. They went, they went through the desolate city and the endless streets of which, split by saltiness, there was the sound of a piano lesson, just like the one that Fernanda heard during the siestas of her adolescence. They went on board a riverboat, the wooden wheel of which had a sound of conflagration, conflagration and whose rusted metal plates reverberated like the mouth of an oven. Mamie shut herself up in her cabin. Twice a day, Fernanda left a plate of food by her bed, and twice a day she took it away intact, not because Mamie had resolved to die of hunger, but because even the smell of food was repugnant to her and her stomach rejected even water. Not even she herself knew that her fertility had outwitted the mustard vapors, just as Fernanda did not know until almost a year later when they brought the child. In the suffocating cabin, maddened by the vibration of the metal plates and the unbearable stench of the mud stirred up by the paddle wheel, Mimi lost track of the days. Much time had passed when she saw the last yellow butterfly destroyed in the blades of the fan, and she admired as an irredeemable truth that Mauricio Babylonia had died, oh, and she admitted, excuse me, as an irredeemable truth that Mauricio Babylonia had died. She did not let herself be defeated by resignation, however. She kept on thinking about him during the arduous mule back crossing of the hallucinating plateau where Aureliano Segundo had become lost when he was looking for the most beautiful woman who had ever appeared on the face of earth, and when they went over the mountains along Indian trails and entered the gloomy city in whose stone alleys the funeral, funeral bronze bells entered the gloomy city, when they went over the mountains along Indian trails and entered the gloomy city in whose stone alleys the funereal bronze bells of 32 churches tolled. That night, they slept in the abandoned colonial mansion on boards that Fernanda laid on the floor of a room invaded by weeds, wrapped in the shreds of curtains that they pulled off the windows and that fell to pieces with every turn of the body. Mimi knew where they were, because in the fright of her insomnia, she saw pass by the gentleman dressed in black, whom they delivered to the house inside a lead box on one distant Christmas Eve. On the following day, after Mass, Fernanda took her to a somber building that Mimi recognized immediately from her mother's stories of the convent where they had raised her to be a queen. And then she understood that they had come to the end of their journey. While Fernando was speaking to someone in the office next door, Mimi remained in a parlor checkered with large oil paintings of colonial archbishops, still wearing an edamine dress with small black flowers and stiff high shoes, which were swollen by the cold of the uplands. She was standing in the center of the parlor, thinking about Mauricio Babylonia, under the yellow stream of light from the stained glass windows, when a very beautiful novice came out of the office carrying her suitcase with three changes of clothing. As she passed Mimi, she took her hand without stopping. Come, Renata, she said to her. Mimi took her hand and let herself be led. The last time that Fernanda saw her, trying to keep up with the novice, a 
iron grating of the cloister had just closed behind her. She was still thinking about Mauricio Babylonia, his smell of grease, and his halo of butterflies, and she would keep on thinking about him for all the days of her life, until the remote autumn morning when she died of old age, with her name changed and her head shaved, and without ever having spoken a word in a gloomy hospital in Krakow. Fernanda returned to Macondo on a train protected by armed police. During the trip, she noticed the tension of the passengers, the military preparations in the towns along the line, and an atmosphere rarefied by the certainty that something serious was going to happen. But she had no information until she reached Macondo, and they told her that Jose Arcadio Segundo was inciting the workers of the banana company to strike. That's all we need, Fernanda said to herself, an anarchist in the family. The strike broke out two weeks later, and it did not have the dramatic consequences that had been feared. The workers demanded that they not be obliged to cut and load bananas on Sundays, and the position seemed so just that even Father Antonio Isabel interceded in its favor because he found it in accordance with the laws of God. That victory, along with other actions that were initiated during the following months, drew the colorless Jose Arcadio Segundo out of his anonymity, for people had been accustomed to say that he was only good for filling up the town with French whores. With the same impulsive decision with which he had auctioned off his fighting cocks in order to organize a hair-brained boat business, he gave up his position as foreman in the banana company and took the side of the workers. Quite soon, he was pointed out as the agent of an international conspiracy against public order. One night, during the course of a week darkened, darkened by somber rumors, he miraculously escaped four revolver shots taken at him by an unknown party as he was leaving a secret meeting. The atmosphere of the following months was so tense that even Ursula perceived it in her dark corner, and she had the impression that once more she was living through the dangerous times when her son Aurelio carried the homeopathic pills of subversion in his pocket. She tried to speak to Jose Arcadio Segundo to let him know about that precedent, but Aureliano Segundo told her that since the night of the attempt on his life, no one knew about, no one knew his whereabouts. Just like Aureliano, Ursula ex exclaimed, it's as if the world were repeating itself. Fernanda was immune to the uncertainty of those days. She had no contact with the outside world since the violent altercation she had had with her husband over having decided Mimi's fate without his consent. Aureliano Segundo was prepared to rescue his daughter with the help of the police if necessary. But Fernanda showed him some papers that were proof that she had entered the convent of her own free will. Mimi had indeed signed once. She was already behind the iron grating, and she did it with the same indifference with which she had allowed herself to be led away. Underneath it all, Aureliano Segundo did not believe in the legitimacy of the proof, just as he never believed that Mauricio Babylonia had gone into the yard to steal chickens but both expedients served to ease his conscience, and thus he could go back without remorse under the shadow of Petrocortes, where he revived his noisy revelry and unlimited gourmandizing. Foreign to the restlessness of the town, deaf to Ursula's quiet predictions, Fernanda gave the last turn to the screw of her preconceived plan. She wrote a long letter to her son, Jose Arcadio, who was then about to take his first orders, and in it she told him that his sister, Renata, had expired in the peace of the Lord and as a consequence of the black vomit. Then she put Amaranta Ursula under the care of Santa Sofia de la Piedad and dedicated herself to organizing her con correspondence with the invisible doctors, which had been upset by Mimi's trouble. The first thing that she did was to set a definite date for the postponed telepathic operation, but the invisible doctors answered her that it was not 
wise so long as the state of social agitation continued in Mukondo. She was so urgent and so poorly informed that she explained to them in another letter that there was no such state of agitation and that everything was the result of the lunacy of a brother-in-law of hers who was fiddling around at that time in that labor union nonsense just as he had been involved with cockfighting and riverboats before. They were still not in agreement. On the hot Wednesday, when an aged nun knocked at the door bearing a small basket on her arm, when she opened the door, Santa Sofia de la Piedad thought that it was a gift and tried to take the small basket that was covered with a lovely lace wrap. But the nun stopped her because she had instructions to give it personally and with the strictest secrecy to Doña Fernanda del Carpio de Buendía. It was Mimi's son. Fernanda's former spiritual director explained to her in a letter that he had been born two months before and that they had taken the privilege of baptizing him, Aureliano, for his grandfather, because his mother would not open her lips to tell them her wishes. Fernanda rose up and sighed against that trick of fate, but she had sufficient strength to hide it in front of the nun. We will tell him that we found him floating in the basket, she said, smiling. No one will believe it, the nun said. If they believe it in the Bible, Fernanda replied, I don't see why they shouldn't believe it from me. The nun lunched at the house while she waited for the train back, and in accordance with the discretion they asked of her, she did not mention the child again. But Fernanda viewed her as an undesirable witness of her shame and lamented the fact that they had abandoned the medieval custom of hanging a messenger who bore bad news. It was then that she decided to drown the child in the cistern as soon as the nun left, but her heart was not strong enough, and she preferred to wait patiently until the infinite goodness of God would free her from the annoyance. The new Aureliano was a year old when the tension of the people broke with no forewarning. Jose Arcadio Segundo and other union leaders who had remained underground until then suddenly appeared one weekend and organized demonstrations in towns throughout the banana region. The police merely maintained public order. On a Monday night, the leaders were taken from their homes and sent to jail in the capital of the province with two pound irons on their legs. Taken among them were Jose Arcadio Segundo and Lorenzo Gavilan, a colonel in the Mexican Revolution exiled in Macondo, who said that he had been witness to the heroism of his comrade Artemio Cruz. They were set free, however, within three months, because of the fact that the government and the banana company could not reach an agreement as to who should feed them in jail. The protests of the workers this time were based on the lack of sanitary facilities in their living quarters, the non-existence of medical services, and the terrible working conditions. They stated, furthermore, that they were not being paid in real money, but in scrip, which was only good to buy Virginia ham and the company commissaries. Jose Arcadio Segundo was put in jail because he revealed that the scrip system was a way for the company to finance its fruit ships which, without the commissary merchandise, would have to return empty from New Orleans to the banana ports. The other complaints were common knowledge. The company physicians did not examine the sick, but had them lined up behind one another in the dispensaries, and a nun would pull, put a pill the color of copper sulfate on their tongues, whether they had malaria, gonorrhea, or constipation. It was a cure that was so common that children would stand in line several times, and instead of swallowing the pills, they would take them home to use as bingo markers. The company workers were crowded together in miserable barracks. The engineers, instead of putting in toilets, had a portable latrine for every 50 people brought to the camps at Christmas time, and they held public demonstrations of how to use them so that they would last longer. The decrepit lawyers dressed in black who during other times had besieged Colonel Aureliano Buendia, and who now were controlled by the banana company, dismissed those demands with decisions that seemed like acts of magic. When the workers drew up a list of unanimous petitions, 
A long time passed before they were able to notify the banana company officially. As soon as he find, found out about the agreement, Mr. Brown hitched his luxurious glassed-in coach to the train and disappeared from the condo along with the more prominent representatives of his company. Nonetheless, some workers found one of them the following Saturday in a brothel, and they made him sign a copy of the sheet with the demands while he was naked with the women who had helped to entrap him. The mournful lawyers showed in court that the man had nothing to do with the company, and in order that no one doubt their arguments, they had him jailed as an imposter. Later on, Mr. Brown was surprised traveling incognito in a third-class coach, and they made him sign another copy of the demands. On the following day, he appeared before the judges with his hair dyed black and speaking flawless Spanish. The lawyer showed that the man was not Mr. Jack Brown, the superintendent of the banana company, born in Prattville, Alabama, but a harmless vendor of medicinal plants born in Macondo and baptized there with the name of Dagoberto Fonseca. A while later, faced with a new attempt by the workers, the lawyers publicly exhibited, exhibited Mr. Brown's death certificate, attested to by consuls and foreign mister, ministers, which bore witness that on June 9th last, he had been run over by a fire engine in Chicago. Tired of that hermeneutical delirium, the workers turned away from the authorities in Macondo and brought their complaints up to the higher courts. It was there that the slight of hand lawyers proved that the demands lacked all validity for the simple reason that the banana company did not have, never had had, and never would have any workers in its service because they were all hired on a temporary and occasional basis. So that the fable of the Virginia ham was nonsense, the same as that of the miraculous pills and the yuletide toilets, and by a decision of the court, it was established and set down in solemn decrees that the workers did not exist. Workers' rights. The great strike broke out. Cultivation stopped halfway. The fruit rotted on the trees and the 120 car trains remained on the sidings. The idle workers overflowed the towns. The street of the Turks echoed with a Saturday that lasted for several days, and in the pool room at the Hotel Jacob, they had to arrange 24-hour shifts. That was where Jose Arcadio Segundo was on the day it was announced that the army had been assigned to re-establish public order. Although he was not a man given to omens, the news was like an announcement of death that he had been waiting for ever since that distant morning when Colonel Jerry Nelva Marquez had let him see an execution. The bad omen did not change his solemnity, however. He took the shot he had planned, and it was good. A short time later, the drum beats, the shrill of the bugle, the shouting and running of the people told him that not only had the game of pool come to an end, but also the silent and solitary game that he had been playing with himself ever since that dawn execution. Then he went out into the street and saw them. There were three regiments whose march in time to a galley drum made the earth tremble. Their snorting of a many-headed dragon filled the glow of noon with a pestilential vapor. They were short, stocky, and fruit-like. They perspired with the sweat of a horse and had a smell of suntanned hide and taciturn and impenetrable perseverance of men from the uplands. Although it took them over an hour to pass by, one might have thought that they were only a few squads marching in a circle because they were all identical, sons of the same bitch, and with the same stolidity, they all bore the weight of their packs and canteens and shame of their rifles with fixed bayonets and the chancre of blind obedience and a sense of honor. Ursula heard them pass from her bed in the shadows and she made a cross with her fingers. Santa Sofia de la Piedad existed for an instant, leaning over the embroidered tablecloth that she had just ironed 
and she thought of her son, Jose Arcadio Segundo, who, without changing expression, watched the last soldiers pass by the door of the Hotel Jacob. Martial law enabled the army to assume the functions of arbitrator in the con controversy, but no effort at consolation was made. As soon as they appeared in Mokondo, the soldiers put aside their rifles and cut and loaded the bananas and started the trains running. The workers, who had been content to wait until then, went into the wood with no other weapons but their working machetes, and they began to sabotage the sabotage. They burned plantations and commissaries, tore up tracks to impede the passage of the trains that began to open their path with machine gun fire, and they cut telegraph and telephone wires. The irrigation ditches were stained with blood. Mr. Brown, who was alive in the electrified chicken coop, was taken out of Mokondo with his family and those of his fellow countrymen and brought to a safe place under the protection of the army. The situation was threatening to lead to a bloody and unequal civil war when the authorities called upon the workers to gather in Mokondo. The summons announced that the civil and military leader of the province would arrive on the following Friday, ready to intercede in the conflict. Okay. Just getting a grip on what just was discussed. The military command. Okay. Jose Arcadio Segundo was in the crowd that had gathered at the station on Friday since early in the morning. He had taken part in a meeting of union leaders and had been commissioned, along with Colonel Galevan, to mingle in the crowd and orient it according to how things went. He did not feel well, and a salty paste was beginning to collect on his palate when he noticed that the army had set up machine gun emplacements around the small square that the wired city of the Banana Company was protecting by artillery pieces. Around 12 o'clock, waiting for a train that was not arriving, more than 3,000 people, workers, women, and children, had spilled out of the open space in front of the station and were pressing into the neighboring streets when the army had closed off, which the army had closed off with rows of machine guns. At that time, it all seemed more like a jubilant fair than a waiting crowd. They had brought over the fritter and drink stands from the Street of the Turks, and people were in good spirits as they bore the tedium of waiting and the scorching sun. A short time before three o'clock, the rumor spread that the official train would not arrive until the following day. The crowd let out a sigh of disappointment, an army lieutenant then climbed up onto the roof of the station where there were four machine gun emplacements aiming at the crowd and called for silence. Next to Jose Arcadio Segundo, there was a barefooted woman, very fat, with two children between the ages of four and seven. She was carrying the smaller one, and she asked Jose Arcadio Segundo, without knowing him, if he would lift up the other child so that he could hear better. Jose Arcadio Segundo put the child on his shoulders. Many years later, that child would still tell, to the disbelief of all, that he had seen the lieutenant reading decree number four of the civil and military leader of the province through an old phonograph horn. It had been signed by General Carlos Cortes Vargas and his secretary, Major Enrique Garcia Isaza, and in three articles of 80 words, he declared the strikers to be a bunch of hoodlums, and he authorized the army to shoot to kill. After the decree was read, in the midst of a deafening hoot of protest, a campaign took the place of the lieutenant on the roof of the station, and with the horn he signaled that he wanted to speak. The crowd was quiet again. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, the captain said in a low voice that was slow and a little tired, you have five minutes to withdraw. The redoubled hooting and shouting drowned out the bugle call that announced the start of the count. No one moved. Five minutes have passed. 
the captain said in the same tone. One more minute and we'll open fire. Jose Arcadio Segundo, sweating ice, lowered the child and gave him to the woman. Those bastards might just shoot, she murmured. Jose Arcadio Segundo did not have time to speak because at that instant he recognized the hoarse voice of Colonel Galivan echoing the words of the woman without a shout. Intoxicated by the tension, by the miraculous depth of the silence, and furthermore convinced that nothing could move that crowd held tight in a fascination with death, Jose Arcadio Segundo raised himself up over the heads in front of him, and for the first time in his life, he raised his voice. You bastards, he shouted. Take the extra minute and stick it up your ass. After his shout, something happened that did not bring on fright, but a kind of hallucination. The captain gave the order to fire and 14 machine guns answered at once. But it all seemed like a farce. It was as if the machine guns had been loaded with caps because their panting rattle could be heard and their incandescent spitting could be seen. Not by not the slightest reaction, but not the slightest reaction was perceived. Not a cry, not even a sigh among the compact crowd that seemed petrified by an instantaneous invulnerability. Suddenly, on one side of the station, a cry of death tore open the enchantment. Ah, mother! A seismic voice, a volcanic breath. The roar of a cataclysm broke out in the center of the crowd with a great potential of expansion. Jose Arcadio Segundo barely had time to pick up the child while the mother with the other was swallowed up by the crowd that swirled about in panic. Many years later, that child would still tell, in spite of people thinking that he was a crazy old man, how Jose Arcadio Segundo had lifted him over his head and hauled him almost in the air as if floating on the terror of the crowd toward a nearby street. The child's privileged position allowed him to see at that moment that the wild mass had started to get to the corner and the row of machine guns opened fire. Several voices shouted at the same time, get down, get down. The people in front had already done so, swept down by the wave of bullets. Survivors, instead of getting down, tried to go back to the small square and the panic became a dragon's tail as, as one compact wave ran against another, which was moving in the opposite direction toward the other dragon's tail in the street across the way where the machine guns were also firing without cease. They were penned in, swirling about in a gigantic whirlwind that little by little was being reduced to its epicenter as the edges were systematically being cut off all around like an onion being peeled by the insatiable and methodical shears of the machine guns. The child saw a woman kneeling with her arms in the shape of a cross in an open space mysteriously free of the stampede. Jose Arcadio Segundo put him up there at the moment he fell with his face bathed in blood. Before the colossal troop wiped out the empty space, the kneeling woman, the light of the high drought-stricken sky, and the horrorish world where Ursula Iguaran had sold so many little candy animals. When Jose Arcadio Segundo came to, came to, he was lying face up in the darkness. He realized that he was riding on an endless and silent train, and that his head was caked with dry blood, and that all his bones ached. He felt an intolerable desire to sleep, prepared to sleep for many hours, safe from the terror and the horror, he made himself comfortable on the side that pained him less, and only then did he discover that he was lying against dead people. There was no free space in the car except for an aisle in the middle. Several hours must have passed since the massacre because the corpses had the same temperature as plaster in autumn and the same consistency as petrified foam. 
that it had. And those who had put them in the car had had time to pile them up in the same way in which they transported bunches of bananas. Trying to flee from the nightmare, Jose Arcadio Segundo dragged himself from one car to another in the direction in which the train was heading, and in the flashes of light that broke through the wooden slats as they went through sleeping towns, he saw the man corpses, woman corpses, child corpses, who would be thrown into the sea like rejected bananas. He recognized only a woman who sold drinks in the square, and Colonel Galliman, who still held wrapped in his hand the belt with a buckle of Morelia silver with which he had tried to open his way through the panic. When he got to the first car, he jumped into the darkness and lay beside the tracks until the train had passed. It was the longest one he had ever seen. With almost 200 freight cars and a locomotive at either end and a third one in the middle, it had no lights, not even the red and green running lights, and it slipped off with a nocturnal and stealthy velocity. On top of the cars, there could be seen the dark shapes of the shoulders with their emplaced machine guns. After midnight, a torrential cloud burst came up. Jose Arcadio Segundo did not know where it was that he had jumped off, but he knew that by going in the opposite direction of the train, he would reach Macondo. After walking for more than three hours, soaked to the skin with a terrible headache, he was able to make out the first houses in the light of dawn. Attracted by the smell of coffee, he went into a kitchen where a woman with a child in her arms was leaning over the stove. Hello, he said, exhausted. I am Jose Arcadio Segundo Buendia. He pronounced his whole name, letter by letter, in order to convince her that he was alive. He was wise in doing so, because the woman had thought that he was an apparition as she saw the dirty shadowy figure in, with his head and clothing dirty with blood and touched with the solemnity of death come through the door. She recognized him. She brought him a blanket so that he could wrap himself up while his clothes dried by the fire. She warmed some water to wash his wound, which was only a flesh wound, and she gave him a clean diaper to bandage his head. Then she gave him a mug of coffee without sugar, as she had been told the Buendias drank it, and she spread his clothing out near the fire. Jose Arcadio Segundo did not speak until he had finished drinking his coffee. There must have been three thousand of them, he murmured. What? The dead, he clarified. It must have been all of the people who were at the station. The woman measured him with a pitying look. There haven't been any dead here, she said. Since the time of your uncle, the colonel, Nothing has happened in Mocondo. In the three kitchens where Jose Arcadio Segundo stopped before reaching home, they told him the same thing. There weren't any dead. He went through the small square by the station, and he saw the fritter stands piled one on top of another, and he could find no trace of the massacre. The streets were deserted under the persistent rain, and the houses locked up with no trace of life inside. The only human note was the first tolling of the bells for mass. He knocked at the door of Colonel Galliban's house. A pregnant woman, whom he had seen several times, closed the door in his face. He left, she said frightened. He went back to his own country. The main entrance to the wire chicken coop was guarded, as always, by two policemen who looked as if they were made of stone under the rain, with raincoats and rubber boots. On their marginal street, the West Indian Negroes were singing their Saturday songs. Jose Arcadio Segundo jumped over the courtyard wall and entered the house through the kitchen. Santa Sofia de la Piedad barely raised her voice. Don't let Fernanda see you, she said. She's just getting up. As if she were fulfilling an implicit pact, she took her son to the chamber pot room arranged Melchiades' broken-down cot for him, and at two in the afternoon, while Fernanda was taking her siesta, she passed a plate of food into him through the window. 
Aureliano Segundo had slept at home because the rain had caught him there, and at three in the afternoon he was still waiting for it to clear. Informed in secret by Santa Sofia de la Piedad, he visited his brother in Milquiades' room at that time. He did not believe the version of the massacre or the nightmare trip of the train loaded with corpses traveling toward the sea either. The night before, he had read an extraordinary proclamation to the nation which said that the workers had left the station and had returned home in peaceful groups. The proclamation also stated that the Union leaders, with great patriotic spirit, had reduced their demands to two points, a reform of medical services and the building of latrines in the living quarters. It was stated later that when the military authorities obtained the agreement with the workers, they hastened to tell Mr. Brown, and he not only accepted the new conditions, but offered to pay for three days of public festivities to celebrate the end of conflict. Except that when the military asked him on what date they could announce the signing of the agreement, he looked out the window at the sky, crossed with lightning flashes, and made a profound gesture of doubt. When the rain stops, he said, as long as the rain lasts, we're suspending all activities. It had not rained for three months, and there had been a drought. But when Mr. Brown announced his decision, a torrential downpour spread over the whole banana region. It was the one that caught Jose Arcadio Segundo on his way to Macondo. A week later, it was still raining. The official version repeated a thousand times and mangled out all over the country. All over the country by every means of communication the government found at hand was finally accepted. There were no dead. The satisfied workers had gone back to their families and the banana company was suspending all activity until the rain stopped. Martial law continued with an eye to the necessity of taking emergency measures for the public disaster of the endless downpour, but the troops were confined to quarters. During the day, the soldiers walked through the torrents in the streets with their pant legs rolled up, playing with boats with their children. At night, after taps, they knocked doors down with their rifle butts, hauled suspects out from their beds, and took them off on trips from which there was no return. The search for and extermination of the hoodlums, murderers, arsonists, and rebels of Decree Number 4 was still going on, but the military denied it even to the relatives of the victims who crowded the commandant's offices in search of news. He must have been dreaming, the officers insisted. Nothing has happened in Macondo. Nothing has ever happened, and nothing ever will happen. This is a happy town. In that way, they were finally able to wipe out the Union leaders. The only survivor was Jose Arcadio Segundo. One February night, the unmistakable blows of rifle butts were heard at the door. Aureliano Segundo, who was still waiting for it to clear, opened the door to six soldiers under the command of an officer. Soaking from the rain without saying a word, they searched the house room by room, closet by closet, from parlor to pantry. Ursula woke up when they turned on the light in her room, and she did not breathe while they, the search went on but held her fingers in the shape of a cross, pointing them to where the soldiers were moving about. Santa Sofia de la Piedad managed to warn Jose Arcadio Segundo, who was sleeping in Milquiades' room, but he could see that it was too late to try to escape. So, Santa Sofia de la Piedad locked the door again, and he put on his shirt and his shoes and sat down on the cot to wait for them. At that moment, they were searching the gold workshop. The officer made them open the padlock, and with a quick sweep of his lantern, he saw the workbench and the glass cupboard with bottles of acid and instruments that were still where their owner had left them, and he seemed to understand that no one lived in that room. 
He wisely asked Aureliano Segundo if he was a silversmith, however, and the latter explained to him that it had been Colonel Aureliano Buendia's workshop. Oh, ho, the officer said, turned on the lights, and ordered such a minute search that they did not miss the 18 little gold fishes that had not been melted down and that were hidden behind the bottles in their tin can. The officer examined them one by one on the workbench, and then he turned human. I'd like to take one, if I may, he said. At one time they were a mark of subversion, but now they're relics. He was young, almost an adolescence with adolescent, with no signs of timidity and with a natural pleasant manner that had not shown itself until then. Aureliano Segundo gave him the little fish. The officer put it in his shirt pocket with a childlike glow in his eyes, and he put the others in a can and set it back where it had been. It's a wonderful memento, he said. Colonel Aureliano Buendia was one of our greatest men. Nevertheless, that surge of humanity did not alter his professional conduct. At Melchiades's room, which was locked up again with the padlock, Santa Sofia de la Piedad tried one last hope. No one has lived in that room for a century, she said. The officer had it opened and flashed the beam of the lantern over it. And Aureliano Segundo and Santa Sofia de la Piedad saw the Arab eyes of Jose Arcadio Segundo at the moment when the ray of light passed over his face, and they understood that it was the end of one anxiety and the beginning of another, which would find relief only in resignation. But the officer continued examining the room with the lantern and showed no signs of interest until he discovered the 72 chamber pots piled up in the cupboards. Then he turned on the light. Jose Arcadio Segundo was sitting on the edge of the cot, ready to go, more solemn and pensive than ever. In the background, where the shelves with the shredded books, the rolls of parchment, and the clean and orderly work table with the ink still fresh in the inkwells, there was the same pureness in the air, the same clarity, the same respite from dust and destruction that Aureliano Segundo had known in childhood and that only Colonel Aureliano Buendia could not perceive. But the officer was only interested in the chamber pots. How many people live in this house? He asked. Five. The officer obviously did not understand. He paused with his glance on the wall where Aureliano Segundo and Santa Sofia de la Piedad were still seeing Jose Arcadio Segundo, and the latter also realized that the soldier was looking at him without seeing him. Then he turned out the light and closed the door. When he spoke to the soldiers, Aureliano Segundo understood that the young officer had seen the room with the same eyes as Colonel Aureliano Buendia. It's obvious that no one has been in that room for at least a hundred years, the officer said to the soldiers, there must even be snakes in there. When the door closed, Jose Arcadio Segundo was sure that the war was over. Years before, Colonel Aureliano Buendia had spoken to him about the fascination of war and had tried to show it to him with countless examples drawn from his own experience. He had believed him, but the night when the soldiers looked at him without seeing him, while he thought about the tension of the past few months, the misery of jail, the panic at the station, and the train loaded with dead people, Jose Arcadio Segundo reached the conclusion that Colonel Aureliano Buendia was nothing but a faker or an imbecile. He could not understand why he had needed so many words to explain what he felt in war, because one was enough. Fear. In Melchiades' room, on the other hand, protected by the supernatural light, by the sound of the rain, by the feeling of being invisible, he found the repose that he had not had for one single instant during his previous life, and the only fear that remained was that they would bury him alive. 
He told Santa Sofia de la Piedad about it when she brought him his daily meals, and she promised to struggle to stay alive, even beyond her natural forces, in order to make sure that they would bury him dead. Free from all fear, Jose Arcadio Segundo dedicated himself then to pursue the manuscripts of Melchiades many times, and with so much more pleasure than he could not when he could not understand them. He became accustomed to the sound of the rain, which after two months had become another form of silence, and the only thing that disturbed his solitude was the coming and going of Santa Sofia de la Piedad. He asked her, therefore, to leave the meals on the windowsill and padlock the door. The rest of the family forgot about him, including Fernanda, who did not mind leaving him there when she found that the soldiers had seen him without recognizing him. After six months of enclosure, since the soldiers had left Mocondo, Aureliano Segundo removed the padlock, looking for someone he could talk to until the rain stopped. As soon as he opened the door, he felt the pestilential attack of the chamber pots, which were placed on the floor and all of which had been used several times. Jose Arcadio Segundo, devoured by baldness, indifferent to the air that had been sharpened by the nauseating vapors, was still reading and rereading the unintelligible parchments. He was illuminated by a seraphic glow. He scarcely raised his eyes when he heard the door open, but that look was enough for his brother to see repeated in it the irreparable fate of his great-grandfather. There were more than three thousand of them, was all that Jose Arcadio Segundo said. I'm sure now that they were everybody who had been at the station. And that is the end of this chapter and of this section. We will begin next time on page 315. Hope you're enjoying this. Leave me a comment. Let me know what you think. And yeah, have a good week. I'll see you on Thursday. Bye.